Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast number two. I'm your host, Sean Wentz. And I'm Evan Faggart. And uh, we are going to talk about some of the uh, most popular, game-changing, most relevant stories in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space this week. So uh, one of the biggest things that happened was uh, Apple changed their policy completely regarding Bitcoin apps. And they're actually going to start al- allowing Bitcoin and virtual currency apps again on the App Store. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that's that's a huge change. Uh, what, what do you think about that, Evan? I think that's going to be pretty, uh, pretty significant uh, advancement for Bitcoin's uh, acceptance, you know, because there's a whole community of cell phone users that didn't have access to Bitcoin wallets, but they do now. Like, yeah. I think... Um, and twenty thousand, I think, uh, blockchain.info wallets were downloaded before Apple banned it. So you know, there's obviously the demand there. Apple users want to use Bitcoin, but they couldn't until now. So it's gonna be really great for Bitcoin. Yeah, great for Bitcoin. Uh, great for Apple users. Great for people who uh, still have iPhones who might possibly buy iPhones now. Uh, because they can use Bitcoin now yeah. on iOS devices, and people might go back to uh, iPhone iPhones after they smash theirs to get the Android, yeah. so they can have a wallet. Yeah, yeah. All those videos that are posted online of people destroying their iPhones <laughs> because they couldn't use it to to manage their Bitcoin anymore. Yep. So I mean, it's really it's good news for everyone. I'm glad Apple decided to change their mind. But Android's still better, though. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I st- you, I'm sticking with Android. Android. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the best. Yeah, fully customized. And, um, w- like, with with Apple products, with iPhones, you can jailbreak them, right? And put your own uh, underground apps on there. Why couldn't um, the Bitcoin people, like, download a jailbroken app for Bitcoin management? Or did, th- did those exist? I don't know. Maybe they do. I don't really, I don't really mess with Apple, so I wouldn't know. Yeah, I mean, I used to have an iPhone a couple of years ago. Actually, I was an iPhone guy. Started out with an iPhone one, and then moved on to an iPhone four after that. And uh, I jailbroke both of them because I wanted to uh, be able to use whatever apps I wanted, not be controlled by Apple's App Store. But that was also before I bought, got into Bitcoin, so I wasn't right. like looking for Bitcoin apps on the on the App Store. But it doesn't matter anymore. No jailbroken, no no jailbreaking needed uh, to use Bitcoin on an iPhone. So good progress. Right. Right also, there. Uh, from what I understand, uh, it's f- a lot more easier to develop apps for iOS than it is Android. So um, we might see more developers making uh ios wallets instead of android wallets yeah yeah that's definitely possible um a coin jar their app is already back on the app store now and um i I think they're still waiting for blockchain but yeah like apple apple released um like a brand new developing code along with that conference and it's called swift and supposedly it's a lot easier than their than their last system. So it'll be interesting to see if a lot of developers uh, kind of flock to Apple's App Store um, uh, now that they do that. And actually, you know what? I think that um, app, develop, app developers should take advantage of this and start accepting Bitcoin for payment. Because that would... Uh, Especially for games that use microtransactions and game microtransactions to make money, it would be really easy to use Bitcoin for that, and uh, there'd be lots of opportunities to profit off that on the uh, iOS platform. You know what? That's that's totally right. Uh, like, there's a whole huge untapped market for. Uh, apps and games specifically where you can like trade bitcoin within the app or uh use digital currency to purchase in-game items or power-ups or whatever right Um, or even like i've i've envisioned before like uh, a shooting game perhaps where for every person you kill on the other side 
uh, you would earn like 0.001 Bitcoin, like a little millibit every time you kill them and it gets transferred to your account. So like, it's kind of an incentive for people to play well. Parents could just like make a Bitcoin wallet and put a set amount of Bitcoins in that wallet and let their kid use it to buy things in their games. Yeah. And they wouldn't have to worry about uh, accidents like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's too many horror stories that come out where uh, the, the parents find out that like thousands of dollars have been charged to their credit (laughs) card. Because they allowed the kid to put the credit card in the app, and it's like, oh, what's what's the kid gonna buy with with you know yeah. on a little cell phone app, you know? But then you know they end up buying like five thousand bars of in-game gold and like all these power-ups yeah, and stuff. It's ridiculous. They they buy like every single power-up in Candy Crush. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I gotta get to the level that my friends are at. It's the only way. <laughs> Yeah. So, oh man, I, yeah, I, I Bitcoin really wouldn't be a great way to monitor that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's just one positive, uh, effect that it's going to have for like parents of kids who use like phones. But I mean, that's just one possibility of, of the untapped potential of digital currency in cell phone apps. I'm really excited to see what developers come up with in the next couple of years. Yeah, me too. It's going to, I mean, Bitcoin is just going to revolutionize everything or it could, it has a potential potential to because it just makes payments so much easier and um i keep thinking about games i know it's just one small small part part, but i i keep thinking about gaming because and if it it seems like uh, microtransactions that's the direction they're going now is is, uh charging like small amounts of money for in-game power ups and things and um if that's the way they can, if that's how they continue to make money off their games, then they should really start accepting Bitcoin. Because people, I think people will be much more willing to do the microtransactions if they could do it as easily as you can with Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely makes things easier. Uh, it really smooths things out in the transaction process. Micropayments, awesome, you know, between people. Pretty exciting stuff. So um, let's move on to another topic. Um, the, uh, the you wrote an article earlier this week about the European uh, Central Bank right. and how they, yeah. how they have a negative interest rate now. Yeah, yesterday morning, the European Central Bank announced that they would be lowering their interest rate into the negative. It's negative uh, negative point one. And what that means is that normally when you like when you have like a one to two percent interest rate, you uh, you actually earn money from having deposits in a bank, you know. And um, but now the bank is act- the central bank is actually going to be charging their member banks to hold to hold uh, deposits with the central bank. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to stimulate the economy because their economy apparently is completely stagnant. And the traditional policy of lowering interest rates to zero percent hasn't worked, so it's this is a very desperate measure that isn't really used a lot. And um, what happened is around the same time that this was uh, that this announcement uh, hit the media, Bitcoin had a two percent spike in in prices, and it's it's generally agreed that it was a, a direct response to this. Uh, your European Central Bank announcement. So what what we're seeing is that people, the the people in the eurozone, they're aware that they're getting ready to lose their money because when when central banks start doing things like this, it's in, it's indicative of um, a coming recession or even a depression. So people, it seems like people in Europe. Are starting to look for alternative uh, methods to preserve their wealth to hedge against the uh, inflation that's that's going to come as a result of these negative uh, interest rates. Yeah, I mean, like, I've I've heard people criticize um, the federal government in the United States for lowering interest rates uh, so low in order to spur lending and and, and such. But I, I never thought that a central bank could lower it to negative, like below zero. <laughs> yeah, d- it's... I didn't even know they could do this. I don't know. I don't know if it's actually been done before. It's been, it's been considered before. Um, 
I would have to look it up to see if anyone has actually done it. Uh, like the U.S. has really shied away from that because of the the risk the risk involved are so great. Uh, you know, people like people could lose their money because they're essentially forcing the banks to to give out loans. And you know, the more yeah. money that's loaned out, uh, the more likely it is that the patrons of the bank won't be able to withdraw their funds, which would you know create a huge disaster. All the banks would fail. So uh, the U.S. has tried to avoid that, and um, they've even they've opted to do quantitative easing instead of negative interest rates. Yeah. So yeah, it's a pretty controversial uh, policy. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's going to work? Do you think it's ac actually going to get the banks to start lending more? Oh, it might. It might uh, get the banks to. I mean, it'll. It'll have to, because um, if the banks want to keep making profit, they're they're not going to make profit by hoarding their money anymore. Uh -huh. They're gonna. They're gonna have to uh, give out loans and charge interest on those loans. Uh, but what's going to happen? Is that that credit expansion is going to cause a huge uh, economic bubble, and um, once the European Central Bank decides that they've stimulated the economy enough, they're going to raise their interest rates to three, four, or five percent, and um, the businesses that are completely dependent upon the cheap credit that came as a result of this negative interest rate, uh, they're not going to be profitable anymore because the only way they could uh, the only way they could stay float was to get credit so um uh financial collapse uh probably even worse than what happened in 2008 and the people i think i think this the direct response we saw um reflected in in the the price of bitcoin um mm -hmm. i think people are starting to realize that and they're starting to to hedge their uh, wealth against inflation and um it, apparently, there some people are turning to Bitcoin as an alternative to fiat money. Huh? Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll have to see. Like, it, this could be like a, a catalyst for um, another bubble, at least driven yeah. partly by Europe. Because I think um, uh, last year or two years ago, I forget which which bubble it was, but it was caused by the partially caused by the fact that Cyprus uh, started shaving um, money. A little bit off the top of people's bank accounts, and uh, they yeah. they started getting worried and looking for new way, new places to put their money and save it. Yeah, and also um, what have what happened in Europe? The like the main part of the Europe uh, financial disaster was that um, the the governments they just they didn't have the tax revenue to fund their. Uh, they're massive welfare states, so they had to borrow money, that, and uh, they they had to borrow money from the central bank, and so um, or, or the central bank had to uh, had to induce a credit expansion yeah. uh, through low through low interest rates, and um, that that pumped up the bubble, and that's why the um, that that's what what what's happening in Greece, uh, Spain, Italy, and all those places, you know. Um, poor right now that they've decided to add uh, revenue generated by illegal prostitution and drugs to their GDP just to boost their numbers like that's how poor they're doing and it's a result it's a result of, of the welfare state and uh, just too much debt uh, if they're gonna include um, prostitution and and other illegal activities in their GDP I mean shouldn't they also legalize it at the same time <laughs> Like you yeah, can't have your cake and eat it too. In that case, that's that's what I would say. They should just if they should just legalize it and uh, bring it turn you know bring it into turn into a white market and yeah. uh, th and then if they're worried about tax revenue, they have that whole new uh, that whole new source of of tax revenue. Yeah, but it would it, make so much if they just regulated yeah. it and and taxed it like you would any other business. I mean, they but, they're so good at taxing things. Why don't they apply it to <laughs> yeah. to the stuff that they want to include yeah. in the GP, GDP anyway? Is that they just want to boost their numbers? They don't really care about the people of of their country. <laughs> well, okay, so 
we're we're leading into black markets a little bit right here. So let's move on to the next topic. Um, there's a study that came out about a week ago. Uh, these researchers did a scientific study on Silk Road. They downloaded the entire Silk Road website uh, during the last month that it was actually in session in October. Or in, in September, actually. It was shut down on October 2nd of last year by the FBI. And these researchers downloaded the entire website uh, with web crawling software and then analyzed the data for all of these different product listings, uh, like which categories th they fell under in terms of drugs, and also which categories they fell under in terms of price and quantity of the product that's being sold. So it's it was really interesting. They found out that actually a lot of the people buying on Silk Road were actually sellers themselves. It wasn't it wasn't all um, like small time drug users going on to get their daily fix or whatever on Silk Road, right. which is what. Uh, most of the media and even some scientific research up until now has characterized it as. So it, they really found that it's interesting that now that there's a lot of, uh, there's a huge vendor to vendor market um, that actually reduces violence in the drug trade. So now you don't have uh, rival street gangs going after each other. Uh, you don't have as many uh, cartels uh, trying to threaten each other, intimidate each other you know decapitating people like <laughs> doing these terroristic acts um it's really not necessary anymore it's impractical yeah. and and really it's impossible on the in the virtual world yeah it's it's i think it's a perfect i think it's an, a, a perfect amazing example of a free market just completely undermining governments outright like they're not they're not finding loopholes they're not operating you know in the dark anymore it it's just everybody knows about silk road and uh silk road just doesn't care about the government and there's nothing the government can do about it and um they're completely legitimizing the drug trade and i think it's amazing yeah well legit legitimizing it in terms of uh like there's there's really no risk to people on there um, as long as people uh, do their research, use encryption for their communications. Obviously, you have to use Bitcoin because it's the only currency you can use uh, for this. Don't use a credit card on, on Silk Road; it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, but like, as long as you get past all the technical hurdles and uh, learn how to use Tor to stay anonymous, um, it's it's really it's quite safe it's much safer than yeah. than the olden days of drug trade where like you would bring out a, a suitcase full of you know hundred dollar bills stacks and you know trade it over by the over by the river uh for like a freaking pound of cocaine or whatever and then you drive away and then you run the risk of having your product stolen like yep. ambushed getting, in the car or, or getting something. shot getting shot like and having your body like uh, you know, set out as an example as to not mess with that particular cartel. All this is, is is crazy, and it all happens because of the illegal nature of the market. That's yep. how criminals behave, so they're already uh, committing a crime. They might as well use threats and intimidation at the same time. But thanks to this study, we now know scientifically that uh, in a virtual world with reputation system, feedback system, uh, it's all... it's it's. It's a safe environment, basically. Yeah, I mean, on Silk Road, uh, it seems like the only thing you have to worry about when you buy drugs from Silk Road is the government. Like, yeah. I've yeah. I've never heard of anybody, you know, getting kidnapped by a car, like by a Silk Road cartel, or you know, getting robbed or anything. Um, there was there was a security breach uh, in Silk Road 2.0 recently. Um, so I guess some hacker got into the servers and stole a bunch of bitcoins. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, Silk Road, the the Silk Road two point administrators or whatever you want to call them, they've paid back eighty three percent of the stolen funds. That's amazing. And um, because they actually care about their customers, uh, it's just it's proof that the drug trade is not inherently violent. Uh, it's the the violence that is that has been prevalent in the drug trade in, in the past several decades has been a result of the government 
actively trying to eradicate drugs from the economy. Yeah. But it's so, it's impossible to do that. All you're going to do is push it underground where these violent people will necessarily take over. And Silk Road is changing that completely. Yeah. I, I kind of look at it um, as it's really like an economics issue where there's a market and a demand for a particular product. Uh, there's going to be middlemen somewhere along the way in the world who will provide the service of getting that product to the people who yeah. want it. So, I mean, it it's, it's a choice that we as a society have to make. Are we going to, you know, give that, that responsibility for de- delivering that product? Are we going to put that responsibility in the hands of, of murderers and, and thieves, uh, just all around unethical people? Or are we going to regulate that market that exists whether you like it or not? Are we going to regulate it and put that responsibility in the hands of, of people who care about feedback, they care about their customers, they care about ethics and not hurting people, and they and they they they're just in it to, to make money. I mean, it's it's a business at the end of the day. Everyone wants profit, right? That's incentives. But you yep. want to make sure the the incentives for such a huge issue as drugs put it put the responsibility in the right hands. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. The problem the problem with uh, banning something uh, to such an ex- to an extent such as uh, the as how we've banned drugs in the U.S. Um, it will it will always become violent no matter what it is that's being banned um, like literally anything you can think of if the government bans it but there's still a demand for that product a huge demand for it yeah. the people who supply it will be violent because the government has a monopoly on law they have a monopoly on uh, dispute resolution uh, on the court yeah. system so when the government bans something, the market no longer has access to a legitimate dispute resolution uh, system. So the only way to solve disputes is through violence. Yeah. But uh, Silk Road is changing that. Uh, I I think I could be wrong, but I I think I heard somewhere that they're de- they're developing um, uh, a trustless decentralized dispute resolution uh, system. And uh, they're also every uh, – you can use escrow for every transaction so you don't have to worry about your bitcoins being stolen. Um, and, if, and if the person you're buying from is willing to use escrow, you know they're a legitimate supplier. Yeah. And um, you know, technology, this, uh, this, whole, uh, this whole wave of decentralization, uh, peer-to-peer distributed networks, it's, it's completely changing the drug trade. And it's, go- it's going to turn it – into a legitimate business, a legitimate profitable business uh, where people, customers don't have to worry about getting killed. They don't have to worry about getting yeah. arrested, whether the government likes it or not. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, the, the only issues that the, that the study says are still down the line for uh, dark net markets, you know, I mean, I'll go down the sh- uh, short list like Silk Road 2.0, um, uh, Open Bazaar is coming out soon. Uh, sheep marketplace, uh, black uh, black market reloader. There's there's a ton. The only problems they really face in the near future are the fact that some of them are still uh, at risk of having having their Bitcoin stolen from hackers. We just saw that happen with Silk Road 2.0 in February. It happened with Sheep Marketplace, although that might have been an inside job. But like, you don't have to worry anymore about rival gangs and and cartels coming yeah. to kill you. Really, you just have to worry about uh, uh, the the system underlying the marketplace not protecting your funds. Right, but and the free market is already coming with solutions to that. Um, like Silk Road 2.0, like I said, they've repaid 83% of all the stolen funds that happened, I think it was in f- uh, February maybe. Um, and you, know, you can pretty much guarantee that they're going to be... Uh, ramping up their security measures it's going to be much harder to hack uh yeah. the to, to hack the uh whatever is whatever they're using to store the bitcoins mm-hmm. um and uh th- this happens in all areas of the economy it's it happen it's happening in bitcoin exchanges too yeah. you know uh bitstamp just th- like they've started auditing themselves to prove to their customers that uh, nothing fraudulent is going on, their money is being kept safe, 
and it's in response to what happened in Mount Gox. And it's all happening independent of government. The government has nothing to do with this. It's just free market solutions. They're, they're happening spontaneously in, in response to, th to things that have happened in the past. Yeah, it's it's really it's it's competition throughout the marketplace. As there's more uh, comp competitive actors, more really good competitive actors, they all help each other uh, achieve a higher standard because no one wants to go out of business. No right. one wants to just disappear, evaporate. Uh, so now that we have yeah multiple exchanges all competing with each other, um, multiple sources of where to get bitcoins. Um, and then the parallel on the darknet markets, there's, I think there's like at least a dozen now, like they're not all totally reputable, but there's a, there's a lot of competition in that space now. And yep. if any one of them like accidentally loses funds and can't pay everyone back, well, that they just go away. They just, no one bails them out. Uh, so it's, it's really competition and free market that helps to achieve a higher standard for everyone. Yeah, I think I think what a lot of people fail to realize about the free market is that um, in a free market where there's no government safety net, there's no bailouts, and uh, these businessmen are held accountable for what they do, uh, that creates an environment where the consumer decides who wins. They decide who gets profits, and because of that. Uh, entrepreneurs they're going to do whatever they can do whatever is humanly possible to provide a good customer experience and uh, this, this is why competition produces uh, lower prices it's why it produces uh, higher quality goods um, and it's and it's why these thing these uh, increases in security are happening with thing with uh, things like Silk Road and Bitcoin exchanges it's it's because the people who run these operations are being held accountable by the held accountable by, by the, the consumers, market, basically, yeah. because there's no one there to bail them out. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of a breath of fresh air a little bit, you know. Uh, I, like, I you where do you which which uh, state do you live in? Wisconsin. I live in North Carolina. My bad, North Carolina. I'm in, I'm in California, but like it's it's obvious in this state at least that we have some crippling regulations that kind of don't set up a free market uh, environment at all and it's a breath of fresh air to see the free market uh, being revived on the internet really yeah it's it's only gonna get better too I mean there like th there's only it's it's only like a fraction of the world that even has internet access and the the more available internet becomes to the world just the more uh, the larger these uh, online enterprises will be at yeah. some point it's just going to render government completely irrelevant um the governments won't be able to do anything to, to stop these decentralized uh uh deep web operations evan do i sense a, a bit of a, a libertarian streak among you or a little no, bit of an anarchist no, streak, no. a little bit. I, I'm not. I'm not an anarchist at all. No? <laughs> Anarcho-capitalist, maybe. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe a little oh, bit. Slightly, slightly. <laughs> some Stefan Molyneux uh, going on. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Molyneux. Oh, really? But, yeah. All right. Well, um, we are currently at 29 minutes, so uh, we'll we'll stop it right there. Uh, all pretty right. good discussions this week about yeah. uh, the free markets and and uh, where the dark net is going and such. Um, so that's that's it for this second episode of the Coin Brief podcast, and uh, thank you guys for watching. We're your hosts, Sean Wentz, and I'm Evan Faggart, and we will see you guys next week. <laughs>